people are human in a common way. And that's the that's really the commonality of it all is that that so many of these different roles, whether it's artist or billionaire or a homeless person, that the human being who is inhabiting that existence is powerfully human in good and bad ways that we overlook when characterizing them as a type of person. I'm Nathan Maharaj, and this is Kobo in Conversation. In this episode, recorded in person in Kobo's new office in downtown Toronto, I spoke with novelist Tom Rackman, author of books including The Imperfectionists and The Italian Teacher. It's our first in-person episode of Kobo in Conversation since 2020, and that's why it sounds a little different from the episodes we've been making over Zoom over the last few years. We'd love to hear your thoughts, so don't be shy about sliding into our DMs on social. Anyway, it was a real delight to have Tom come by, and I hope you enjoy listening to the two of us in conversation about his new, the novel, new novel, The Imposters. It's a novel about a novelist, but a novelist unlike any I can recall meeting in fiction before. Dora Frenhofer was once successful and well-known, but that was some time ago. We meet her in old age as she feels some cognitive decline, perhaps, that stands out a little more to a person who trades on feats of imagination and memory. And though she'd be the first, I think, to declare that the world doesn't need another Dora Frenhofer book, she's pushing herself to finish this one final novel. Tom Rackman, welcome to Kobo. Thank you so much. I've taken a stab at, at describing Dora. Tell me, how do you describe her? How would you introduce her? Well, it was a very good stab. <laughs> I would say that uh, beyond what you said, she is somebody who is looking back over her life and over her imaginative life and trying to figure out exactly what it all amounted to. And the way that the story, the way that the novel works is that she's writing the book that you're reading. So as it goes along, you see her writing it or trying to write this book, but you also see the chapters of what she's doing. And those chapters are imaginative works, but they're also works that end up giving a clue to the life that she lived. And she spent decades from her childhood in the Netherlands um, through various travels and ending up in London. She spent decades in a sort of creative isolation, thinking about other people, but, but doggedly devoted to her writing career. So imagining people and creating people on paper while separating herself from the real version of them. And she's looking back at, from a point of obscurity, wondering about what it was all for, whether it made sense, whether it was worth it, particularly at a time when the culture, both literary and non-literary, that she's surrounded by feels quite alien to her. And she feels rather estranged in the, in the cultural moment and is further estranged by the fact that the pandemic is going on. And so she is, she is not just, she's living a, a deeper version of her normal isolation. In this case, she's isolated as everybody else is, thinking about everybody else who's not there, and also thinking about herself and the human beings who she is now apart from, but who peopled her past and who peopled her work and who in a way constitute what she was. And she's trying to figure out what it all meant. One of the things that I love about how you set her up is um, she fills in, I think, a blank space that a lot of us, um, a lot of us book people, um, we, we, we often look past. And I think it's what it might be like to be the writer who, who was, you know, the finalist several times for a major award, um, maybe never won it, uh, clearly talented, able to do the work. Writing a novel is very hard. This is a, this is a person who can, who can do it well and has done it multiple times. So there's, there's no question of talent. Um, but they just, it, they just haven't like landed in that golden circle. Um, there's a line in it. Uh, Dora has managed to keep barging her volumes into stores over the years, a succession of small novels about small men in small crises. I think I'd be a fan of hers. I think I, I think I'd really enjoy her books. I, 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 if only if only uh, she if there was more more than than the one uh, the imposters available to us. Does does your characterization of Dora come from an admiration of that kind of writer? Um, what what sparks that? Where do you why do you reach in and grab that that particular profile of author? 
Well, I think that there are a few reasons. One is that I can identify with that myself. I mean, I think that it's, it's a, a constant situation that you're in when trying to write literary fiction, a sense that nobody really cares that much about what you're trying to say mm -hmm. and that you have no particular justification for anybody to care about it. And it's rather presumptuous that you would even hope that they would care because you're sitting around writing things that you think inter are interesting and, and characters that, that somehow stimulate and captivate you, maybe writing for a number of years and trying to flesh these out. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of it, if you're lucky enough, you find a publisher who will put it out and then you, you sit around desperately hoping that people will care and they have so many other things to care about and uh, you can only hope that somehow the right combination of factors adds up that, that people will look at it and will find it compelling and will want to take it up. But the truth uh, for most writing is that, that it is obscure and ignored and the vast efforts that the writer puts in are never reciprocated really by the public and the writer has no right to expect that they should be. You're just living in, in hope and lost in years of, of work. So part of it is my own experience. Mm. And the other part is that I suppose that even outside of my own experience, I've always been interested in creativity and in the arts and how it works and understanding what it is that inspires people, what, where creativity comes from and how it works in the nitty gritty. So even the, some of the past books that I've written have touched on this. My previous novel was called The Italian Teacher and, and it was set in the world of, of um, visual arts, painting and ceramics and things like that and trying to work out exactly how success and fame and again, the creative process worked there. So it's, it's an abiding interest of mine, something that I find fascinating, that what is that magic that happens in people's heads when they are left alone with their own imagination and some sort of frame within which they're working, whether it's a, a canvas or a page, and how is it that from there they then draw out something that might even surprise them and that if it works also thrills them and maybe connects to other people. Because ultimately I think that the the objective of most creative work is to connect that hidden inner part of yourself with other people, to find other people and to, to let them know what you think and how you feel. And it's not that you're writing what you feel at all times. You're trying to create something, but in so doing, you're trying then to connect with others. There's something that um, the writer uh, David Foster Wallace once said. He's not a writer I particularly like, but he had a very good comment where he said something like we're each marooned inside our own skulls and mm. I th and that uh, the I think the implication being that through writing then each of these um, shipwrecks in our own heads uh, tries to shout to the other shipwrecks and I feel like like that in a way that is um, both the project and of of creative work but also the thrill of it whether you're doing it or whether you're receiving it it is that sense that you're getting a little insight into somebody else's um locked brain and mm -hmm. i think that 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 process and the both the the bliss of the work and the anguish of its most likely failure is something that that i find fascinating why would people persist and why do i persist <laughs> um why? Why indeed? Um, <laughs> Thanks. You're not supposed to say that. You're supposed to say you should. You should persist. Well, no. I mean, I was I was taking the the the, the question at the most at the most broad existential interpretation. That's and, fine. Uh, I was staring into the abyss, and it it uh, it stared back, um, backing away from the edge. There's a line. Um, there's a line early on where Dora uh, says something like. She had some luck early on and mistook it for for a career. I, I love that line. It breaks my heart. I think it's a trap. A lot of us fall into, aside from aside from creative arts, aside from from uh, um, uh, literary fiction, um, we get signals when we're young. We we then a young person then makes a plan for an adult who then has to live with with the consequences of it. Um, that's not how it should be. Unfortunately, that's how it is. Uh, I want to ask you though: Was that a fear you had back in 2010 when the Imperfectionist came out? You're experiencing something incredible. It's a really successful debut. It's a wonderful novel, and it was and uh, and it, it was a it was a, it was a like an international su success. I think. Did you have a sense um, of my God? I think I'm experiencing something. I think I'm experiencing something that may be distorting my sense of 
how I should be making decisions about what to do with my life. It's definitely not something that I, I would have thought at the time. And I don't think I, I don't think it would have been reasonable for somebody to think about it. You know, if you have uh, it was my first novel and I had no experience of having published any books before that. So mm -hmm. I had no idea what the whole process was like. And mm -hmm. it just seemed at the time what it did seem to me was an extra it was an extraordinary series of good fortunes. It did feel like a lot of things just fell into place. Some of them that were totally serendipitous and didn't have to happen that way, but had and then had therefore worked. And I was aware that you couldn't count on that happening every time. But I didn't really have any insight into what would happen in my future, nor what books I would write, nor how they would be received or any of that. I think at, at that stage, it was just I was kind of in shock because my hope had been to one day publish a book and to see a book of mine on my shelf and just it was it had been properly published that was the extent of my my uh, ambition and my aspiration and then once it actually happened and it was received well and it was kind of you know it got proper attention and and um, and people writers I'd, I'd admired from afar and strangers ended up praising it too and I was I, I this was far beyond anything that I had I had really uh, bargained on or hoped for even. Mm -hmm. So that was overwhelming and a thrill. Um, so I, I, I didn't, I was just overwhelmed by it at the time. I didn't really, I wasn't planning how I would respond to future experiences. Mm. In setting up Dora, um, was it a little bit of like, like, I mean, it, it might be my own twisted psychology of thinking sometimes back on like, the way something could have gone, the way I might have interpreted an event, the way maybe I was lucky in seeing something correctly and making a correct decision, or, or, or I could have, you know, if I had exercised poorer judgment, I might have decided, oh, this is big, I can, I can do this forever, or, or something to that effect. Was it just, um, um, I think I'm like poking at that, that, that psychic wound of Dora's, of, of that idea of being in, in old age and thinking maybe your career was a mistake based on a youthful misinterpretation of, of, a, of a lucky at bat. Yeah, well, she, she's not a writer who ever had huge success. She was somebody who was always on the fringes, but her career has decidedly gone downhill in recent mm. years to the extent that that there, a new novel is selling 42 copies or something like that worldwide. I believe 86. Is it 86? It was 86. It's increased since I wrote it. it. Was, yeah. That's good for her. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so she's she's not really uh, thriving in that way. But she is. She had a stage decades before where she was sort of in li in the literary world and mm. felt connected to it. And so she's looking back and and wondering, um, you know, what exactly happened and. And I think that, I mean, there's something that you said earlier about, about uh, the, the, the complexity and difficulty of making decisions at a certain point in your life that become your life. And you have to, I mean, I often think about this in terms of people who get tattoos, which is not something I've done, but that I always think that, that if you, among the, the, the problems of getting a tattoo is that you spend the rest of your life having to kind of not just explain why, but defend an earlier version of yourself. Like that it seems to me that, that a, a reason for not getting tattoos or doing other tattoo-like experiences is that it's nice to have that freedom to continue to define yourself and be who you want to be or try to understand what you want to be uh, without being tied to the earlier versions. And it's impossible to do that, I stress. Mm. It's not like there's, there's one way to live in an, an untattooed life to continue this <laughs> metaphor much too much. It, because ultimately you do have to make decisions about your, the people that you're with, the friends you make, the place, the city you live in, mm -hmm. the jobs you take or don't take and all of that. And, and you find as the years accumulate that, that there's a tendency to kind of defend an earlier version of yourself to always be, to be saying, well, yes, I, you know, it's great that I have this collection of ceramic pigs because I love pigs more than anything else. And maybe you don't anymore, but you did when you were 12 and everybody gave you pigs and you never got rid of them. And so I think that, that there is a, there's a version of this that, that goes on in your life. And she is, um, but I, but I think that is a question of whether, you are that same person. And it's not like there's a moment where you're suddenly a different person. Mm. But you do have occasional inflection points, I think, over the course of your life where something big changes. And, and uh, in my life, it's tended to be when I've moved cities, which I've done quite a few times. And when I've done that, I go to the new place. And 
not re not necessarily consciously intending to. I sort of reinvent myself a bit. And when I return to the former place and see the, the old friends and the old places, um, I'm only then really struck by how different I've become, but also by the very fact that you are a different person at different stages, a profoundly different one, and trying to figure yourself out as, mm. and maybe only figuring out who you were in retrospect. So she is looking at her life as a writer which has been the defining trait for all of her adult life but feeling like she's done in a way that she doesn't really know that there's that anybody cares anymore about what she has to say in which case what's the point of doing it and if she is going to stop if this is going to be her last book then who is she after that because that's all she's been really mm. is a person trying to understand other people and trying to write stories and trying to interest the public in reading them and once that goes then is she a husk or is there more to her? And was she right to have pursued that if it ends in this way? And that's kind of a central question of the book. Hmm. In, in, uh, in The Imposters, uh, you mentioned your abiding interest in, in the lives of artists, the lives of creative people, creative work. But in The Imposters specifically, there's a lot of different kinds of writing. It's just it's just everywhere. Um, some of it is it w would, would, would just pass, pass you by if you weren't looking for it. But once you start looking for it, it's everywhere. Um, there's really visible writing. There's like newspapers and magazines and those ways uh, that uh, that sort of often make up the, the life of someone who calls themselves a writer. Um, but there's ghost writing for a stand-up comic. Uh, there's social media even, you know, t uh, and taken seriously enough as a, as a form of expression. Um, there, there's even uh, uh, Mr. Bot, one of the characters, uh, has has a has, has a little bit of a literary theory of suicide notes. I wonder, can you, can you tell me about populating the book with that many varieties of writing? Well, you're absolutely right. It's, yeah. it's sort of variations on a theme, isn't it? That it's ways to express yourself and in writing, in words, and trying to figure out how to do it and what the place is in different contexts. So there's, a, there's also the, that character you mentioned, Mr. Bart, is also writing letters to a prime minister. And there's, you know, as you said, there's a, there's a guy who's a food writer in Paris. And there's a teacher in Copenhagen who also writes the occasional journalism and it gets mm. her in all sorts of tangles. And there's even one character who is in prison and that character in prison finds a pen and then something does or doesn't happen with it. But, um, but there's, again, you've got exactly as you said, you have, you're visiting this idea of writing over and over again, where it's not necessarily the central point of the story, but it's a theme that, a motif that keeps coming up. Mm. And I suppose that the, the larger thought that I had without trying to have a, any prescriptive answer or anything, it's just the idea of what is, what is Dora doing? What is the point of this? What are the point of writing? Why are people doing this? What is it for? What can it achieve? And why do we do it in all of its different forms? And ultimately, what is the space for it and the place for it in a culture that is blaring with words mm. all at the same time? And you can often only hear the loudest, most obnoxious ones over top of the more thoughtful, sophisticated, kind ones. And uh, in that context where something as, as um, small in some ways, but large in others, as literary fiction, where does it fit in all of this? in a world that is not really paying a great deal of attention anymore and has many other things, many other forms of stories and many other activities. Mm. And so that's, that's her question is, how does writing fit in? What is it for? And that's a fundamental um, thought through this whole book. Uh, well, I thought it was, it was really beautiful actually that, that there was this, um, this endless representation of different modes of writing because it, it made me made me think it's kind of a beautiful way in, in which you can think of it as this profoundly human thing uh, that we all do um, and you know world you know, the world has never been more literate than it is now we spend so much time reading one another unfortunately you know maybe we're not reading necessarily the voices that do us the, the most good um, but it was it was I, I thought it was beautiful to think just for a moment that that my God we're just always doing this. And it was a little bit bittersweet, maybe thinking like along the lines of the David Foster Wallace observation you, you, you brought up of that. We do this thing 
but it's really, I mean, the, the island metaphor, the, 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 in our own uh, castaways, in our own skulls, that we're, uh, we're putting these messages in bottles, like just constantly, and, and sending them out to sea. And I think that my, my, I think a concern I would have about the culture now is that there's a great deal more sending of bottles than reading of notes. Mm. Uh, you know, it would be nice if, if people continued to be excited about the prospect of somebody's mind that is really different from theirs and something that, that everybody has spoken about endlessly for years now is the this propensity to immerse oneself in ideas and theories and claims that are comforting and that mm. confirm your existing biases rather than accepting that those other brains marooned in, marooned in those other skulls are really different than you and mm. it's interesting to try to figure that out without necessarily demanding that they all conform to what you want but recognizing that some will be really brutally opposed to you mm. and if you care about understanding humans then you it's worth trying to understand some of that too right though though each of these chapters uh in the imposters has these these filaments of connection to diary entries that 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 um that intersperse uh, between them, I I got a sense of of the novel as as almost a maybe a clockwork something modular that and it made me wonder were there earlier drafts in which you know there were more pieces maybe pieces have been removed um, or perhaps in you know midway through the revision process you decided. I'm hitting this tone. This tone is sustaining too long. I want to. I want to break it. I want to drop something in the middle that, that gives me a little bit of contrast. Was it kind of a modular project, or or did it tumble out sort of sequentially? Um, well, I wouldn't. I don't think of it quite as modular. Maybe because it makes me feel like I'm a piece of IKEA furniture. Which <laughs> would be, would be, let's let's call it more I, like a short, like a short story cycle almost. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I think. I mean, I always conceived of it as a single piece that was composed of separate pieces. And mm -hmm. my very first novel, The Imperfectionist, had a similar kind of structure that each of the chapters told a story that s stood alone, mm -hmm. but that weave was weaved together both by uh, a continuous tale that fed through each of them, and also by the characters in some cases appearing in each other's stories. So the mm -hmm. person who had been the main character in, in story three ends up being a walk-on part in story five, but you kind of understand that character in a different way. And that was a structure that appealed to me greatly because it felt like you had a few things at once. It allowed you to, to have a, a, um, an encapsulated small piece that began and ended and something that you could probably read really in one sitting, but also with the satisfaction of that longer um, form of a novel where it feels like things are adding up into something larger. Mm. Um, and it was, both, uh, it was both stimulating to to um, write and fun to construct and plan as well because you had a sense that you were not just constructing each story but constructing a larger construction out of stories. So in that respect, your, your point of the modular uh, description of it uh, stands. Um, but in the case of this book, I had the, some of these story ideas in mind, um, but at the same time as I was writing them, I was always thinking about how they all fit in with each other. Mm -hmm. And in a way, it's, I, I found that it's best not to overthink that because otherwise you can get trapped in, in always thinking how this is going to work in another story, but it has to work on its own terms. And then once you have that established, once you've told the tale of the, the, the person writing stand-up comedy in LA or the, or the, 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 the person in a, in a prison possibly in Syria and all of these things, then, then once that story stands up, then you start to think about the way that each of them end up f um, infiltrating the other ones and affecting each other by being stacked one after the other. Mm. Stacked, I'm really sounding like Ikea now. <laughs> mm. uh, you said it was fun to, to, to plan it that way. Was there one section that was the most fun to write? Um, they're all stimulating and satisfying in different ways but i think i'm guessing the one you might be hinting at is is the the in the middle of the book there is a chapter right in the, in the middle uh, and in this respect it was very intentionally constructed that way which is a satirical kind of comic chapter about a very pretentious brooklyn novelist who ends up at an australian literary festival where he feels like a complete oaf and a uh, and a schmuck and he he wanders around to all these 
events and has various humiliations visited upon him <laughs> and, and has his literary um, aspirations and pretensions um, squashed uh, time and again. But the reason for that is that in the course of this book, there are a lot of, um, I think, powerfully sad chapters. And I hope it's not overall, uh, I, I hope that the book has enough humor in it all the way through that uh, there's a, you end up with something melancholy, not mm. bleak, but melancholy, that there, is, uh, there are sad things in this book as there are tragic things in the world and it tries to address some of those directly. But as with, again, as with my first novel, The Imperfectionists, I had in that one, right in the middle of the book, a comic chapter. And in this one I did as well. I felt like there was, it needed a, a you needed to kind of exhale after mm. some of the tense, um, distressing even sequences that happened before and after. And so um, that one, uh, also because it's from the perspective of a foolish novelist being uh, humiliated while promoting a book was something that, that I could certainly uh, relate to personally. So it was good fun to, to uh, unleash some of my own um, angst about, about various bad events that I've been involved in. Uh, and, and you're absolutely right. Yes, that was my favorite. It was my favorite also because I love, I, I love seeing uh, the nitty gritty of this crazy business sometimes down to things like you know, people think, oh, an author visiting a bookstore. What a delight it must be for the bookstore. But it's so nerve wracking because as we look, as we see in, in in the story, if you if you sign a book, I can't send it back to the publisher. So I need to be sure, like my odds of selling it need to be high enough that it's it's so awkward. I've been that bookseller. I've been in the store. I'm like, welcome, yeah, and just like, can we just face your books out and hope they sell and and not have you you know make them unreturnable? Uh, yeah, that was that was that was fantastic. Uh, it was, and it's so, and it's it's funny because, of course, it's no longer my life. So, so that's uh, probably would have been traumatic had it, if, I, if I actually had to show yeah. up, show up to the bookstore the next day. Four novels in now. I think readers have a sense, maybe, of what a Tom Rackman book is is going to be. I think we're going to get a sense of we're going to get some aspect of tension between a creative act or product and the person bringing it into in, into existence, maybe, um, but. Each of your books is so wildly different in subject matter and structure. I mean, even as you as you allude to parallels between the imposters and the imperfectionists, they're still very different books, and they're, they're they're setting out in very different ways to do the things that they do. Does it surprise you, um, though, when you read through a final draft of a novel that has been, that you've constructed in novel ways, and see it in conversation with your other books? Or is that fine, or is that where you set out? Or is that actually not even an interesting question? No, it is an interesting question. I think that um, it also feels like a dangerous one mm. for the following reason that, uh, I should add, a danger that I'm, welco I'm happy to step into. It's not really dangerous, but <laughs> nothing in books is, unless they close on your nose when you fall asleep. But uh, dangerous for the reason that I think that I feel wary of becoming too self-conscious of thinking mm. about what is it that I do and what is it that, what is that, you know, you said like a Tom Rackman novel, the idea of there being a Tom Rackman novel as a type of thing seems strange to me. I think that I just am writing the books that I want to write at a certain time. And if I were to look at them uh, and analyze and realize, oh God, I'm doing the same thing over and over, that would be, that would be um, uh, startling. But I would say that I feel like um, the way that they relate to each other is that you do, in some respects, start to think, oh gosh, I'm actually seem to be interested in such and such. I keep doing stuff that is is uh, that, and I have this style. And I think that when I observe those, if anything, I I don't sort of actively force myself not to do it anymore. Mm. But I wonder if maybe I should be looking in a different direction, if I should be doing something different. But I do know as well that I always had, I long had this thought from when I first started writing that I thought that that because I had been a journalist before this and I had I had deliberately gone into journalism and gone into, into international reporting because I wanted to enrich my life and experiences to be able to write more broadly and more fully about human beings and the world. And so I thought, well, the nature of writing novels is that you're in a room on your own just conjuring the stuff up. Stuff up. And I felt like there was a danger. The danger was that you would spend your first 35 years of life living in the world 
and you, if you were lucky enough to get a, to publish a book at 35, you spent the next 35 writing about the first 35. <laughs> and you do see that in certain writers where they maybe write a good book and maybe write a second good book and the third and the fourth and the fifth and the 18th start to feel quite like the first four. Mm. So I feel like uh, I've always been aware of that and I try to escape my study in between books and do other things and I also still write journalism now and then in order to have a way to, to forge out from my head aside from my study and really meet other people and go to places and all of that. And, and I think that um, part of that is from a consciousness and an awareness that I don't want there to be a, a let's say, a, a novel that is the kind of novel that I would do that would mm -hmm. be obvious. Um, and in a way, I think actually you could make a case that, that uh, writers can be served by writing versions of the same novel again. Mm -hmm. Because if people like a certain novel, then uh, both the publishers and the public in some degree might be happy to have another version of that, just like you have with, 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 with bands that, you know, if you loved album X, you want the next one to be not quite the same, but kind of similar enough that you feel like you don't want to say, oh, it's not as good as their previous one. Yeah. So I think that there's a conflict in, in all of the arts where on the one hand, you want to recapture what people appreciated and how you connect with them. You want to be able to connect with them again. But on the other hand, you also want to be continuing to create, not just reciting. Um, and uh, that feels uh, fundamentally important. And, and really, the excitement of writing requires it. But because of the fact that my books, aside from anything else, they're always quite connected with politics and culture, and they explore the world as well. Uh, they all take place in different cities around the world yeah. that I go to and research when I can. Uh, then, because of that, then I feel like there, I try to maintain a connection to the outer world that will hopefully keep the work fresh while I can't escape the fact that there, there's going to be a certain style and a way of writing and too many colons included if it's something I've written. Yeah. Was, was that sense of, of not not wanting to be the writer who um, who repeats themselves, who runs out of steam early, is is that what pushed you with the Italian teacher to to tackle visual art? Just to just like there were there were a lot of writers in the imperfectionists. Writing is all over um, uh, your second novel, uh, the Rise and Fall of Great Powers. I, I'm always stumbling on that one. The Italian teacher goes into visual art. Was that was that you deliberately saying nope, no writers, Tom? We're gonna we're gonna do something else. In a way, yeah, I think it was a way to to really dig deep into creativity in one of the fields that that is the most that we, we consider most uh, most fruitfully um, creative because there's so many different sorts of things that you can do in the visual arts while they still count as that. And there's also it also allowed me a bit of distance from uh, the world that I knew. So it allowed me to think about. Mm -hmm creativity without it being too much connected to my own experience. And also, as I alluded to before, I'd always been fascinated with, with, uh, with the different forms of creativity. And I'm not skilled in visual arts, really. I appreciate them immensely, but I can't draw a cat. And so <laughs> uh, I was curious to try to understand that. And it, it, it refreshed in me the fascination that one has, I think, with art forms you can't do. But mm. you can recognize how brilliant they are, but you just can't do it. As I, I feel that as well for music, although I was a musician for a while, but so bad that I feel like I count as a non-musician. So I think that all of those different forms, that there's something for me hugely attractive and fascinating about the creative act, the creative life, where it all comes from and what it's really like inside. And I've had glimpses over the course of the past 10, 15 years. I've had glimpses into various different art forms, both things that I've done and things that I've seen. And I like to open it up and expose it a bit because I think there's all sorts of false notions that people have about, mm. about creativity and about creative industry that I find I, when I discovered the truth about them, I thought it was fascinating. So I think it's great to be able to write about them for that, others. That feels like a, a journalist's instinct uh, expressed through fiction. Yeah, definitely. I think that uh, I don't think that my my writing is journalistic in style at all. Mm. But I think that I have 
in, undoubtedly been affected by having worked in journalism, something that, again, I only got into in order to accumulate experiences to write about, but it affected me much more broadly. It, it, it not only taught me ways to write, but also ways to structure stories, and it encouraged in me this, this excitement about discovering and exposing other things that I don't mean in a exposing in the sense of breaking news way, mm -hmm. but just that, that you often find yourself through journalism in situations that you head out in your, in your car or your, whatever it is, your plane, you're on the boat to this destination you're going to report about. And as you're heading there, you think to yourself, it's going to be like this. And I think I'll maybe ask these questions and I'll, I'll write that sort of a, a lead to the story. And, and I hope to speak to this kind of person and get that kind of thing. And you get there and you're wrong. You are completely wrong <laughs> about all of your expectations. And you, you are even more wrong if you're doing a good job. Right. Because if you get there and it just confirms what you thought, then something has gone wrong. And I think that, that there is, um, I, I drew from that the idea that all of these different worlds that we're looking in from outside, peeping through the windows, that when you get inside, they're really different. And people are human in a common way. And that's the that's really the commonality of it all, is that, that so many of these different roles, whether it's artist or billionaire or homeless person, that the the hum the human being who is inhabiting that existence is is powerfully human in good and bad ways that we we overlook when characterizing them as a type of person. And what fascinates me in writing, both as a reader and as a writer, is trying to figure out people who I'm not and trying to explain what that life is like. Mm. Well, uh, thank you for uh, thank you for giving us that window into Dora Frenhofer and the Imposters. Uh, it's a fantastic book, uh, and thank you for for coming by and having this conversation with us. Thank you, Nathan. An absolute pleasure. Novelist Tom Rackman live in conversation with me at Kobo's new home in downtown Toronto. Tom's new novel, The Imposters, is wonderful, and it's easy to get your hands on through the link in the show notes, or just swing by kobo.com slash conversation. Kobo in Conversation is produced and occasionally hosted by me, Nathan Maharaj. Subscribe in your podcast player to catch every episode, and maybe share this one with a friend you've been meaning to hang out with in person. Thanks for listening. 